I will try to speak over the thunder. Let's begin this morning by talking about former heavyweight boxer James Quick Tillis. He is a cowboy from Oklahoma. And it seems back in the 80s that he fought out of a little known town a couple of hours south of here known as Chicago. Ever heard of it? Thought maybe you had. He's a deeply religious man. Tillis is perhaps best remembered for the fact that he was the first guy to go the distance with then heavyweight champion Mike Tyson. Of course, Tillis has had his disappointments since then, but he apparently hasn't allowed that to rob him of his sense of humor. He still remembers the first day that he came into the Windy City. I got off the bus from Tulsa, he says, with two cardboard suitcases, and I looked with inspiration at the Sears Tower. And I set my suitcases down, and, and, and I said to myself, you know, I'm going to conquer Chicago. But then when I looked down, my suitcases were gone. What a way to begin a boxing career, huh? <laughs> but you know what, Tillis? He was a guy who didn't quit. He may not have accomplished all that he set out to do, but he was not a quitter. How many of you ever watched 60 Minutes on Sunday night TV? If you have, then perhaps you recall this old, surly-looking guy by the name of Andy Rooney. He was sort of the equivalent of a Cracker Barrel philosopher. And to use his oft-quoted phrase, have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed how much the Bible talks about quitting? Or more specifically, not quitting. Yeah, the Bible has a lot to say about this. Let's take Jesus, for instance. Here are two important remembers that Jesus likes to talk about. First, we pretty well know, of course, remember the Sabbath, one of the Ten Commandments. We know that one. But how about the second one? It comes from Luke chapter 17. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife? Yeah. Remember Lot's wife? She was the gal who, when the angels were sent to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and when she and her family were told to leave Sodom and not look back, what did she do? Yeah. She looked back. And thus, she turned into what? Of course, a pillar of salt. Why a pillar of salt? Well, salt in the scriptures always has this sort of preserving quality to it. So it signifies incorruption, durability. So maybe, maybe God used this enduring image to teach those who would follow. Don't forget. See Lot's wife. She's a cautionary tale, folks. Don't end up like her, the Bible is telling us. And besides, in biblical days, how would they often note certain events that they didn't want to forget? Well, they would set up a monument there, what they called a standing stone. In the Hebrew, they were called mashavah. I've seen a lot of those standing stones during my two trips to Israel, going around all the archaeological sites. These markers, they allowed many people to be able to ask questions when they saw them. Hey, wh wh what happened here? And then somebody in the know would be able to tell them, well, let me tell you the great thing that God did here. And then someone would be able to answer their question. In some cases that meant that the standing stone was a great miracle, and in other cases it signified a warning. And so it was with that pillar of salt representing Lot's wife. It was a standing stone, as if to say, 
Look what happened here. She looked back. Don't let such a thing happen to you. In fact, at the time of Christ, thousands of years after Lot's wife, that same pillar of salt, it was still supposed to be standing there, according to Jewish historians like Josephus. And so when Jesus said, remember Lot's wife, people did. It's like the story that Jesus tells in Luke 14 about a guy who begins to build a tower and he gets it partially finished and then he doesn't have enough money. So he doesn't get it done. He, he quits like Lot's wife. He turns back. His tower ends up looking like this big colossal standing stone, a cautionary tale, a, a byword. Something that he was not able to finish. And so people would go by and they would wag their heads and they would say, hey, see that tower? There's a guy who didn't count the cost. There's a guy who wasn't able to finish what he began. Don't be like Lot's wife. Don't be like that guy who couldn't finish his tower. You know, it's ironic how often that real life imitates the Bible. When I was back home last weekend, a tragic event occurred. Of course, most of you have heard of Cedar Point. I've got to drive by Cedar Point on my way to get here. There was a guy who was riding this famous ride called the Raptor, and apparently he left his cell phone in his pocket, and when he went upside down, it slipped out, and it fell down beneath the ride in this area that is all fenced off. And after the ride, he snuck over, he climbed over the fence into this restricted area, and you can imagine what happened to him. Like Lot's wife, he turned back. He didn't turn into a pillar of salt. It was just as bad. Or how about the town I started pastoring in in my late 20s through to my early 40s. And while I was there, there was actually this unfinished tower. And it was built by this televangelist by the name of Rex Humbard. How many of you remember old Rex? Some of you do remember him. There it sat, bigger than life, next to his beloved Cathedral of Tomorrow. And at the peak of his ministry, Rex and his TV signal went out to over 2,000 television stations over the course of the world in 92 languages. I mean, this was the guy who did Elvis's funeral. That's how big he was. And his wife, Maud Amy, now there was a strange bird. A guy from my church was actually her personal painter. She had some pretty odd decorating tastes, I've heard tell. But old Rex's grand vision, going to build this huge tower, a monument to his great ministry, came to a crashing halt when he ran out of money. And as a result, he had to sell his whole ministry complex, including that tower, and it was then bought out by an even weirder TV evangelist, a guy by the name of Ernest Angley. So Angley, toupee and all. He set up his shop there, Angley's road manager, when he would go on the road and do his crusades across the world, happened to also be a realtor. And she sold Cindy and I our first house in Akron. And I was dying to ask her about Ernest's to pay. But I was good. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, but just like that story in the Bible, folks would drive by that tower and they would just wag their heads and say, now there's a guy who started, but he couldn't finish. He quit, so he slunk out of town with his tail between his legs. Don't be like him, the Bible says. Don't be like Lot's wife. Or how about a few chapters earlier? 
Luke chapter 9, where Jesus, he talks to this guy, and the guy says, well, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And so Jesus says to him, no one, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Reminds me of two more things while I'm on a roll this morning. First, a Christian rock group that I heard back in the early 80s when I was in college. I can admit that it's been that long ago. They sang a ballad. The words went something like this. I should be a pillar of salt. I've looked back so many times. Yeah, there's that image of who? Yeah, Lot's wife from a minute ago. But then the song went on to say, when you put your hand to the plow, don't look back. And when you hear that final vow, don't look back. Now we already know where Jesus pulled that first image. Yeah, Lot's wife. But where did he pull the second image of that plow? Probably from 1 Kings chapter 19. Remember the message I did back there in July when I first arrived here? I was talking about the passing of the baton. We looked at the story of the baton pass between the prophet Elijah and his successor Elisha. That day we looked at the end of the story from 2 Kings. But actually the story starts back in 1 Kings when Elijah is called by God. He goes to a certain field where he finds this young man named Elisha plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Imagine that, folks. That's 24 oxes. So Elijah comes up to Elisha. He, he takes off his mantle, places it on the young man's shoulders, symbolizing the fact that this kid is going to be his successor. And, and what is Elisha's response? Well, immediately, he, he leaves his oxen and he follows Elijah. He, he sacrifices all 24 oxen. I, imagine that. He burns his wooden plows and his yokes, and in the fire, he cooks the oxen so as to be able to give the meat to his people. That's how thoroughly Elisha left behind his old life. That's how utterly that he broke with his past. Yeah. When you put your hand to the plow, don't look back. And that's exactly like our lesson for today that we heard in the book of Joshua. Remember when Israel, they came to the border of the, the promised land, they sent 12 spies in to check out everything, and how 10 came back, they turned back and said, the land is, is filled with all of these giants. Yeah, they put their hand to the plow. But then they turned back. But two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, they said to the people, hey, the Lord has, has given us this land flowing with milk and honey. We can take this sucker. But the people... Listen to who? Yeah, the ten. And so they were consigned to, to wander in the wilderness for 40 more years. So now fast forward several more decades. And Moses is now gone, and Joshua has finally led the people into the promised land. And just as God had promised, God had helped them to conquer the land's pagan inhabitants. And now that's, that's all finished. And what does Joshua do? Well, he, he, he assembles all the people. He reminds them of how often their, their ancestors had, had quit and turned back. And in those now long-remembered classic words that you see up on so many people's walls of their houses, what did he say to the people? 
He said, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you are now living. But as for me and my house, we will what? We will serve the Lord. Yeah, I, I, I've decided to follow, Joshua says to the people. No turning back. Which brings us to today's gospel lesson. And let's recall from a few weeks ago that Jesus' ministry, it was now going viral and his popularity it was growing exponentially. He healed the sick and he cast out demons and he fed 10,000 hungry people. So people followed because their needs were being met. In fact, as a result, they, they sought to, to make him Israel's king. But this was not what Jesus wanted to be. He didn't want to be king over their country. He wanted to be king over their lives. And so in our lesson from John 6, we get to read these words. From that time on, many of his disciples turned back. And he no longer went about with him. Folks, I want you to, to notice here that it does not say that many in the crowd turned back or many that he fed turned back. After all, we, we might expect that. Like so many today, there will always be church hoppers and church shoppers hopping from church to church. And of course, I always tell folks, if you find a perfect church, then go to it. Of course, once you get there, it'll no longer be perfect. And why? Because you are there. You think about that for a minute. I mean, we could understand if, if John had said that many of the 10,000 turned back. But again, let's remember, what does he say to us? He says again, from that time on, many of his disciples turned back. And they no longer went about with him. And that means that some of the church elders and, and, and deacons and board members and Sunday school teachers and choir members and ushers, they turned their backs on Jesus. The ship was taking on water. It was in danger of sinking. It seems even Jesus couldn't keep everyone happy. You know what? I find myself starting my 33rd year in the ministry. And I got to tell you, when I was a young guy, wet behind the years as a preacher, I tried to keep everyone happy. And in the process, I bent myself so much into a pretzel that I had trouble untying the knots again. Yeah. It's impossible, isn't it, to make everyone happy. Jesus knew that. So sometimes he painfully had to let go of certain people. He knew that ultimately if he tried to hold on to those who put their hands to the plow, but, but then they were, were always looking back, then such folks would be like an anchor always dragging down the ship. He wanted only those who were committed full bore to the cause for which he was sent. And that's why when he began talking in today's lesson about eating his flesh and drinking his blood and, and taking up uh, a cross and following him that many, they, they counted the cost and they turned away. They quit. And I'm sure that that hurt because some had been with him since near the beginning. Could they not see that he was the one to come? Not a king of their country, but the king of their lives? Researchers, they tell us that 
nationally right now every week over 53,000 people leave the church never to return again. 53,000. And, and yet even among those who remain, the research shows that only about 20% are really committed to their faith. And why is that? Is it because there are so many casual worshipers who only come when it's convenient? Some on Christmas and, and Easter? Are there so few that are willing to really serve the Master? Jesus said, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. I love the article I, I read recently in which the author tells of visiting this fast-growing church over in Minnesota and he came away with some new insights because one of the phrases they used often over at that church was we want our members to wear aprons and not bibs. What an interesting phrase. Aprons, not bibs. And here's what they meant, apparently. Bibs are meant for people who want to be fed. Bibs are for those who aren't ready or willing to feed themselves. Bibs are for those who are more interested in being served than in serving. Bibs are for babes in the faith. On the other hand, aprons are for those who have a heart to serve others in Jesus' name. Aprons are for those who know that they are the church, not a building. Aprons are for those who don't mind getting their hands dirty. Aprons are for those who take the time daily to feed their own spiritual hunger. Aprons are for those who are growing in their faith and they hunger to lead others to where the living bread is. Maybe that's why church growth expert Wynne Arne, when he recently interviewed thousands of Christians in America, and he asked them why they thought the church existed. What was it there for? Do you know what 88% polled said? They said the church exists, exists to serve my needs and the needs of my family. In other words, 88% of Christians in America are still wearing bibs. They believe that the church exists to serve them, not so that they can go and serve the world. And yet, on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, just hours before He was crucified, what did He do? The Son of God took off His outer garments, wrapped a towel around his waist and he got down on his knees and he washed his disciples' feet. And when he was done, he said, I have just given you an example to follow. Now do as I have done for you. We had the blessing back at that church in Akron to build a big addition on and that addition came out towards the road. Its end faced the road. And the people in the church built this gorgeous stained glass window that, that faced the road. And it portrayed Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And underneath was the quote from John 13, 15. Do as I have done for you. We wanted the world to know that we sought to be a church that was wearing aprons. Not bibs. That's what Jesus calls us to do. And just as today, so it was then. The people came to be fed like that plant from the musical Little Shop of Horrors. People cry out, Feed me, Seymour! I'll make it with you! Wow! But when he offered them 
something else. Hey, how's about feeding others? They turned back and quit. See, do you blame Jesus for then turning to the twelve and, and saying to them rather sadly, will you now leave me too? Will you now turn back? Remember Lot's wife? And of course, Simon Peter who answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are the Holy One of God in whom we have come to know and believe. And isn't that why we linger here too, folks? Isn't that why some of us have exchanged our bibs for aprons? Why we decided that just a casual involvement in the life of the church isn't enough. Once we put our hand to the plow, there's no turning back. If He's the Savior of the world, then He deserves our all. It's sort of like Kathleen Norris says in her book Amazing Grace, she tells of an evening when she went to present her book and a woman in the audience asked her a painful question. She said, I don't mean to be offensive, but I just don't understand how you can get so much comfort from a religion whose language does so much harm. And Norris understood the question all too well. She, she knew what it was to struggle with the traditional language of the faith, and yet suddenly she realized the troublesome word in that woman's question was the word comfort. The questioner had asked her how she had found such comfort in her religion. And Norris answered her that she didn't think it was comfort that she was seeking or, or comfort that she had found. Look, she said, as far as I am concerned, this thing you call religion, it saved my life and my husband's life and our marriage. So it's not comfort that I'm talking about. It's salvation. You know, I suspect that there are some within the sound of my voice this morning who have grown perhaps a bit too comfortable in their faith. There could even be those who have been in the church for years and yet they are still wearing bibs instead of aprons. Many who followed Jesus, they turned back. They simply quit like those 53,000 every week. Only His committed disciples remain. Can you be counted in that number? Pray with me. Father, how we long to be like the saints when they will come marching in. Oh, how we long to be in that number. When it's all said and done, Father, may we be found faithful. May we not turn back. Let us put our hand to the plow and move forward as we follow you until the end. This we ask in Jesus' name.